It was seven days before Christmas, 1997, and Roddy and Anne-Marie Aitken had gone shopping for their last-minute Christmas presents, but then disappeared. What had happened to the couple and their Christmas presents? Hi, wee ones. I'm Cole. And I'm Dawn. And this is Scottish Murders. On the 18th of December, 1997, seven days before Christmas, Roddy and Anne-Marie were shopping for the last of their Christmas presents. It was getting late, so the couple called their daughter to say that they would be home in about an hour, but they never made it. Roddy and Anne-Marie grew up on the same council estate in Drum Chapel, which is about seven and a half miles, or 12 kilometres, northwest of Glasgow. Roddy and Anne-Marie went to the same school and hung around in the same groups, so it wasn't surprising when they started dating. The young couple got married when they were both 18, and a year later they became parents when their first child was born. They named her Anne-Marie after her mother. The young family continued to live in the Drum Chapel area, having been given their own council house. Six years later, their family was complete when the second child, Jamie, was born. It was around this time that the couple made the decision to move away from the Drum Chapel area, looking for a better life. And when a council flat exchange came up in the Fulham area in London, they saw this as a great opportunity. The couple lived in the London area, firstly in Fulham and eventually moving to Sutton. Roddy had started his own roofing business and the couple appeared to be doing quite well for themselves. However, after about three years of living in London, the couple's luck changed when Roddy, who would have been about 28 years old, was involved in a car accident. The accident unfortunately was so bad and injured Roddy's leg so severely that he was unable to work again and subsequently had to collect disability allowance. This was a major blow for the young couple who had been doing so well for themselves and had such a young family to look after. Roddy and Anne-Marie, who were both now on benefits, continued as best they could for another three years until an opportunity to swap their London flat for a council house on the quiet rural street of Manse Road in Aberfoyle came up, which they jumped at. Aberfoyle is approximately 27 miles or 43 kilometres northwest of Glasgow. It has beautiful countryside and is known as the gateway to the Trossachs and also where the infamous Scottish outlaw and folk hero Rob Roy McGregor once roamed. So the couple relocated to Aberfoyle and started a new life there. They continued to live there up until their disappearance seven years later. According to the neighbours, the family kept themselves to themselves and never caused any bother. Roddy and Anne-Marie never felt as if they fit into the quiet rural community of Aberfoyle and were constantly lured back into their old haunts in Drum Chapel, with Roddy regularly spending time drinking with his friends from his childhood and Anne-Marie visiting her friends from school. So it appeared that Roddy and Anne-Marie were just a normal couple living a quiet life. They did their best for the kids and made sure they never went without. Despite Roddy and Anne-Marie both being on benefits, they made the decision that for Christmas 1997, they weren't going to spend another Christmas in the cold, wet, dark, snowy Scotland, but instead had booked a two-week holiday to Cyprus for the couple and their son Jamie, who was 13, and they would be flying out on Christmas Eve. The three of them were delighted to be going abroad to a hot country where they could drink, eat, sunbathe and be merry. The couple had saved up £1,000, which is about £1,800 and $2,300 in today's money for the holiday, so they were going to damn well enjoy it. The only thing that perhaps had put a bit of a dampener on the holiday abroad was that their 19-year-old daughter, Anne-Marie, wasn't going to be coming. She was going to be staying at home along with her boyfriend. Roddy and Anne-Marie probably weren't overjoyed about this, but what could they do? She was 19. So, on the 18th of December, 1997, Anne-Marie persuaded Roddy to go with her to see his parents to give them their Christmas cards, as well as going Christmas shopping for a few presents she still had to get for the children. Roddy and Anne-Marie drove to Drum Chapel in their blue Vauxhall Astra to see Roddy's parents. After seeing Roddy's parents, the couple went shopping in the area to buy last-minute Christmas presents. The couple then drove to a supermarket on Milgai Road in Burysden which is about an eight minute drive from Drum Chapel and this is where they were last seen at about 6.45pm. 
Before leaving the supermarket car park, they called their daughter to say that they would be home in about an hour, as they still had bits and bobs to do. It was getting late and it was cold, dark, wet and snowy, but the drive home to Aberfoyle would take approximately 37 minutes. Back at home, Anne-Marie and Jamie waited for their parents to arrive, but they never did. Christmas Day came and went, with Jamie spending the Christmas period not in sunny Cyprus as expected, but at a neighbour's house. Anne-Marie continued to stay at the property in Mance Road along with her boyfriend, waiting for her parents to turn up or for them to call. It wasn't until Boxing Day, after Anne-Marie's grandparents finally pressured her to call the police, that Roddy and Anne-Marie were even reported missing, eight days after their last phone call with their daughter. So nobody called the police to report them missing for eight days? Why? Well, all I could come up with is that their daughter, Anne-Marie, was young and maybe just naive. But why the grandparents didn't call the police straight away, I've got no idea. That's a bit strange. Yeah, definitely. So anyway, on Boxing Day, once the couple had eventually been reported missing, the police instantly treated this as suspicious. And they set up an operation which was called Operation Bermuda, for obvious reasons. Because they went missing. That's clever. Initially, the police organised and carried out massive searches, which included frogmen searching locks and rivers near the couple's home, helicopters sweeping the area, as well as searches being carried out 200 metres or 656 feet from every major road, secondary roads and forest tracks on the way from Drum Chapel to Aberfoyle. This was a huge undertaking as the area goes through forests and the minor roads are winding and isolated. Definitely not the place you'd like to find yourself stranded. The police hoped that they would find the couple's blue Vauxhall Astra, thinking that maybe there'd been some kind of accident, but after six weeks, there was absolutely nothing to be found. They just completely vanished. It was established early on in the investigation that the couple's bank accounts hadn't been touched and there was very little money in their accounts anyway. It's never a good sign when the bank accounts haven't been touched. No, that's a worry. Yeah. Their passports were also with the police, but Interpol had been notified to be on the lookout just in case. A reconstruction of the couple attending the supermarket in Bear's Den was carried out to try and jog anyone's memory about seeing the couple on the 18th of December. There was no information forthcoming and it appeared that the couple had just disappeared into thin air. Now at the same time as the search was being carried out, Detective Superintendent John Ogg, who was leading the investigation, had also ordered a thorough investigation into the Aitkins' life to try and gain a better picture of them. And what he found when delving in a little bit deeper would turn the investigation on its head. It turned out that Roddy was known to the police. Oh, Oh, indeed. It appeared that Roddy liked a good drink and had received a handful of convictions for minor drink-related offences over the years. Also, when drinking with his friends in Drum Chapel, he would regularly drive home, avoiding main roads in case he got caught by the police for drink driving. It also appeared that Roddy drank profusely in all and any pubs in Aberfoyle that would have him, although he had been banned from all but one pub there due to drink-related offences. The police also found out something even more worrying about the Aikens. Apparently, Roddy had beaten Anne-Marie for years. He'd beaten her so badly once that she had to have a metal plate put in her jaw. Oh my god, that's pretty bad. That's real bad. So at this point, the police were starting to think of other theories. Had Roddy finally beaten Anne-Marie so badly that he'd killed her and went on the run? Or had Anne-Marie finally snapped and killed Roddy? Could Roddy have been drinking heavily on the night of the 18th of December and had an accident on one of the back roads home? But surely their car would have been found if there had been an accident. Just to be sure though, the police had circulated the couple's information and their car details further afield for any accidents involving their car. But again, nothing had been reported. If either of them had killed the other one, then due to Aberfoyle and the surrounding areas being so rural, a body could be hidden out there and never be found. The final theory was that a third party was involved in their disappearance. But why and who? The couple's daughter, Anne-Marie, who was then 20, made an appeal on Friday the 18th of January 1998, asking for any information about her parents' disappearance. As the police began to put together a picture of Brody and Anne-Marie's life, 
They also acquired their itemised mobile phone records and one name appeared to come up regularly. It was Ian Mickleham. Ian, who was a 30-year-old farmer who lived in Little Blair Lusk in Gartican, about 17 miles or 27 kilometres southwest of Roddy's house in Aberfoyle. Now, it's not known how the two men became friends. They could have been friends since school, or they could have met in one of the many pubs Roddy frequented. The two men became quite close, and looking at the itemised telephone records, it appeared that they talked regularly, until that is about three weeks before the couple's disappearance. So what had happened? Had the two men had a fallen out? And why? So the police requested Ian's telephone records to try and see if any of his records corresponded with Roddy's telephone records so they could start compiling a database of acquaintances of both men. Through this process, the police noticed a name that kept coming up regularly on Ian's phone, a John Parker. John was 27 and worked on his dad's farm at Crosby Mains, West Kilbride which is approximately 40 miles and 64 kilometres away from Ian's farm. Before long, the police had quite a comprehensive database of contacts stemming from Roddy and Ian's telephone records. Now they just had to figure out what, if anything, it had to do with the disappearance of Roddy and Anne-Marie. Eight weeks into the investigation, a drunk driver was stopped by the police in the Balfron area, which is about 18 miles or 28 kilometres north of Glasgow, and he had a controlled drug on him. This man's name was given to the Operation Bermuda team for them to check against their database, and his name came up as an associate of Roddy Aitken. Two detectives from Operation Bermuda interviewed this man, and they finally had a breakthrough. He told detectives that he had been paid by Roddy to take a parcel of money to Malaga. He informed the detectives exactly how the money was wrapped and how it had got through customs. The detectives took a punt and decided to run Ian's name through the customs and excise database to see if there was any information on him. And lo and behold, they found that Ian had been stopped at Glasgow Airport in March 1997 on his way to Malaga and had been in possession of £15,000 or $21,000, which had been contaminated with drugs. Ian had been let go, but the police had kept the money. The way the money was wrapped exactly matched how the witness said his money had been wrapped by Roddy. There was finally a connection. The police subsequently compared customs and excise database with their own growing database of contacts, all stemming from Roddy and Ian and there were a number of contacts that had been associated with drugs. Slowly, a pattern was building of a drug importation ring with Roddy and Ian being slap bang in the centre of it all. By the middle of March 1998, the police had discovered that Roddy and Ian had made frequent trips to Malaga over the years, each time with large sums of cash, with reasons such as they were planning to buy a car when they got to their destination. They also had received information from informants confirming that both Roddy and Ian were involved in major cannabis smuggling. So they knew how the money was getting out of the country, but they as yet didn't know or have any evidence of how exactly the drugs were coming into the UK. Until that is, a man came forward to state that he had been a drug courier for Ian. Ian had asked him to travel to Malaga and bring back a parcel for him. He said that he had swallowed 70 wraps of cannabis before heading home. Oh, that's quite a lot. However, there was one piece of the puzzle missing. What had happened to Roddy and Anne-Marie? So, the police painstakingly went back over the phone records again. Something had bothered them from the beginning that they wanted an answer to. At 7.05pm on the 18th of December, an unknown number had called Roddy's mobile and spoke to Roddy for six minutes. This was a burner phone, but the police eventually found out that this phone was in fact Ian's. Discovering this fact, the police then believed that they knew exactly what had happened to Roddy and Anne-Marie on the 18th of December 1997. They just didn't know why. On the 23rd of March 1998 at 6am, 14 people involved in the drug smuggling ring including Ian and John, were arrested. Their homes were searched and they were questioned at different locations. Later that day, John Parker finally admitted the truth of what had happened to Roddy and Anne-Marie Aitken. 
even going as far as taking the place to where the remains of the couple were. Oh my god, what happened to them? Well, let me tell you. Go on then. John went on to describe in great detail what had happened the night Roddy and Anne-Marie went missing. Apparently, the lead up to Roddy and Anne-Marie's murder all started a year before in November 1996, when Roddy had given John Parker £30,000 or $41,000 worth of drugs to sell, with his friend Ian vouching for him. John was supposed to sell the drugs and give Roddy the money. However, John decided to keep the money. Roddy was furious about this and obviously pestered his friend Ian constantly to get him the money from John. But this never happened. Roddy was annoyed with Ian for allowing John to get away with this and so started going to Spain and smuggling his own drugs into the UK, cutting Ian out. Ian wasn't at all happy about this and decided the best solution would be to get rid of Roddy permanently. Ah oh, yes, that's the best plan. Yeah, and I don't really think he's got a leg to stand on because his friend just stole £30,000 worth of drugs from him. Well, exactly. Just get the money for your friend and jobs are good in. I know, but the plan to get rid of Roddy was set in motion by Ian and his friend John Parker and it culminated on the evening of the 18th of December 1997. Ian had indeed rang Roddy from his burner phone at 7.05pm and after six minutes finally managed to persuade him to go to his farm that evening, which was 17 miles or 27 kilometres from where the couple were in Bear's Den. And to be fair, it was only a small detour on their way home. And of course, the promise of £30,000 or $41,000 being paid in full would have sealed the deal for Roddy. So the couple set off on the 27-minute journey and would arrive at the farm about 7.40pm, where they were greeted by the waiting Ian. Ian, however, had not banked on Anne-Marie being present too, and so immediately made the decision that they would have to get rid of her as well. Ian approached the driver's side where Roddy was and said to him to come into the house for the money, smiling all the while at the couple he'd known for quite some time and who they saw as a close family friend. Roddy obliged while Anne-Marie waited in the car. He'd just be a minute after all. However, unbeknownst to Anne-Marie, once inside the house, her husband was taken out the back of the farmhouse at gunpoint, made to get on his knees and shot twice by Ian, once in the head, killing him outright. Anne-Marie would have heard the gunshots and probably would have been a little uneasy, but as it was a farm, she maybe thought there was a reasonable explanation. She then saw Ian approaching and again smiling, he asked her to come round the back of the house as he had something to show her, to which she trustingly obliged. As the pair rounded the corner of the house, what she would have seen would have terrified her. Her husband was laying still on the ground with blood all around him, she immediately ran to his side in the hope that she could do something for him. However, as she knelt crying and terrified at her husband's side, family friend Ian shot her twice in the head. Oh my God, that's awful. It really is. When the deed was done, John was responsible for driving the couple's bodies back to his father's farm in the horse box attached to the Range Rover. Ian had spent time chopping up the bodies and putting the parts into black bags before loading the black bags onto the horse box and John driving that hour-long journey south back to his dad's farm, with Ian following behind driving Roddy and Anne-Marie's blue Vauxhall Astra. When they reached John's dad's farm, they proceeded to burn the bodies of Roddy and Anne-Marie. Now, even though Ian had just cold-bloodedly killed his friend and his wife and dismembered the bodies, apparently as the bodies were burning, an arm and a hand moved in the flames. And for one awful moment, Ian thought that it was alive. Apparently, this had caused Ian to have nightly nightmares. Ian and John then disposed of the couple's car. The car has never been found. However, before doing so, John apparently helped himself to the Christmas presents in the couple's car that they had bought for their two children and proceeded to sell them on. Oh, lovely. Yes, what a nice man. He sounds it. When John took the police to where the bodies were, they had to pick through sheep remains until they eventually found the badly burned bodies of the couple. It had taken three months and an extensive investigation, but finally they had the couple's bodies and their murderers, as well as having taken down a vast drug smuggling ring. 
The trial of Ian and John started in August 1998 in Glasgow and lasted for three weeks. The couple's daughter, Anne-Marie, attended every single day of the three weeks, while witness after witness testified against Ian and John. She cried uncontrollably as the evidence was presented, describing just what had happened to her parents at the hands of a family friend. But after three gruelling weeks for the family, finally the verdict was announced. Guilty. When the sentence was read, there was a clear relief displayed amongst the family. Ian was sentenced to a minimum of 20 years and John was sentenced to life. After the uncovering of the world that Roddy had actually been involved in, residents in Aberfoyle who drank alongside Roddy for years admitted that Roddy never appeared short of money and that they were never quite sure where it all came from. But he wasn't the sort of man you asked that question to, being a big burly man who could clearly take care of himself. It was also speculated that perhaps Anne-Marie put off calling the police for as long as she did due to the fact that Roddy was known to the police and he had made it clear he did not like them. But it could equally have been to do with the fact that her boyfriend had been a drug courier for her dad and she didn't want anything like that coming out. Whatever the reason, at last Anne-Marie and Jamie knew what had become of their parents on that fateful night. And that's the end. If you've enjoyed this episode and know just the person who'd also like it, please share it with them. Don't keep it to yourself. Please also get in touch on social media if you have any questions, comments or suggestions and we'll get back to you as soon as we can. All social media and contact details are on our website, scottishmurders.com, as well as all the source material and photos related to this episode. So that's it for this week. Come back next time for another episode of Scottish Murders. Join Join us there. there. Bye. Bye. Scottish Murders is a production of Clurin Torn.